Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching today's Ag Forecast brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions, your premier platform for real-time global insights. Well, on the 5th of every month, we have released to us the new long-range forecast data from the European model. That's what you're looking at here for the time period of December, January, and February of this upcoming winter. Temperature anomalies are on the left, precipitation are on the right. Now, throughout this week, we're also going to get new updates from the NMME, and on Wednesday, I'm going to discuss it, and we're going to look at the skill of these models over the past several months to give us an idea about how much we should trust them into winter. Now currently the models are forecasting a mild winter for much of the lower 48. When I say mild we're just talking here about a couple of degrees but what this tells us is that the models are keeping the coldest air anchored somewhere outside of the lower 48 and I'm going to be watching Alaska and Greenland for those anchors, okay? In terms of precipitation, though, look over here on the right. Now, when you see a mild forecast, a lot of people start thinking, wow, are we just, is winter gone? Are we not going to get the snow we want? The answer to that is absolutely not, except for a few key regions. Now, notice this. We see that the models are favoring a storm track coming into the Pacific Northwest. That would indicate to me that we're going to see a lot of clippers running here along the U.S.-Canada border. We also see the potential for an active Ohio River Valley storm track. That's actually been in the models for a while. What's missing, so coming back to that snow discussion, is the fact that we don't see a strong subtropical jet stream component in the flow setting up yet. Very typical of La Nina. So I'm starting to get concerned about snows that would be in the Sierra Nevada and in the interior here of the Rocky Mountains where we do have expansive drought. This would also indicate a lack of the bigger systems that would uh, cut through parts of Texas, uh, those Texas and Oklahoma panhandle hookers as we call them, or the Arklatex lows that come right out into this region, and also drier conditions in the southeast. Again, that's all a consequence of the lack of a development of a subtropical jet stream pattern. Now remember, when you look at this, don't look at this and just go, well, I'm not going to get anything this winter. It's, it's over. Like some folks might be thinking about that looking right here in the midsection of the country. Not the case. We're looking here at patterns. And again, tune in on Wednesday so that I can show you what I mean by diagnosing those patterns. Now, when we look back over the last week, it has been very dry in large sections of the country. Look at the interior here and also coming back to California. We had the one system that came through and brought in the heavy snow into this part of Kansas, Oklahoma, and Texas. And then our big nor'easter this weekend brought soaking rains from parts of the Appalachian Mountains uh, through the Carolinas up into parts of, of the mid-Atlantic through Virginia. And then up here, right along the coast, some places picking up four plus inches of rainfall within heavy snows and parts of the interior that extended up into Maine. Now, seeing this as the backdrop, where are we going? To get an idea, I want to show you what's currently coming out here from GOES West or GOES 17. It's an infrared satellite view, and there is a deep low curling here up into the Gulf of Alaska. We're going to talk about that in a moment. But this band of moisture targeting British Columbia, this is what we would want to see much farther to the south coming from Hawaii right into California this time of year. But the jet stream is just avoiding that, and it's sending these systems farther to the north. And where's our moisture coming out of the tropics? Well, it's coming out of the intertropical convergence zone here, and then spreading across parts of Mexico, and then it's actually adding to the system that's bringing rain into the Carolinas and some snow today into this part of Virginia. I'll show you that in a few moments. Meanwhile, we do see a shortwave cutting down through the Great Lakes right in through here, which could give us some snow flurries into this section of the Midwest. But outside of that, our exiting nor'easter, things are going to be quite dry through the next several days in the midsection of the country. Let me at least show you the system I'm watching here early this morning. So playing it forward here through early this morning, we can see the heavy rains through southern parts of Florida, the rain, scattered colder rain that's moving through parts of the Carolinas, and then the snow on the back side of it where we do expect to pick up a few inches in this part of Virginia. But you're going to notice that throughout the day today, by mid-morning, much of that has moved off toward the East Coast, and by the afternoon, it's out, okay? We will see through 5, 6 o'clock this evening some scattered showers here. But after that, I'm just going to play this. There's not a lot going on. We do have one little system rolling through parts of Ontario and Quebec, and you can see the snow from that. Remember, today on Monday, some scattered snow showers in this area. And the very tail end of that front tries to cut into parts of the Pacific Northwest, and you can see the rain and some mountain snows out of this. But overall, much of the next week is dry. Let me show you what the European model is suggesting. 
Today, so here's what we see cutting through here. This is valid just uh, through this uh, Thursday evening. So not a lot of moisture to be working with here. Very dry through the interior of the country. Here's the snow, okay, that's coming through this part of Ontario over to Quebec. And you can see that while it's targeting more British Columbia, the very tail end of this hits part of the Puget Sound and the Cascades. After that, we're going to watch this feature here. There's a cutoff low that throughout early part of this week is going to move through California and down into just off the, the, the west coast of the Baja here. And that will eventually eject into the midsection of the country for the weekend. But unfortunately, as it does so, it's not going to be bringing precipitation into California. Let me show what I'm talking about. Jet stream flow right now, screaming across the Pacific, breaks up under that large ridge into Canada we talked about last week. Here's the cutoff load that I'm interested in. And that low, which I'll just put a number one in, is going to be teaming up with a feature that today is sitting right over here. We'll put a two on that. You see, those two features, by the time we get toward this weekend, are going to meet right here in the midsection of the country, producing a low that cuts toward the Great Lakes. That's going to be the next chance at preset for the midsection of the U.S. Meanwhile, before that all happens, here's our subtropical branch of the jet stream, meeting up with the exiting trough from this weekend's nor'easter. And that's what's giving us some unsettled weather in parts of the mid-Atlantic through the southeast today. So this is what we're watching here, a highly amplified pattern. From there, I need to show you what's going on in the upper levels. So what we're going to watch here, okay, here is the, the two troughs that are associated with the nor'easter that we talked about that went through over the weekend. There's the ridge that's behind it. Cutoff low is here, and right there is the shorewave we're going to be watching. It seems quite subtle, but let's keep an eye on it. If we let this play forward and just pause it, that went all the way, by the way, out to Thursday morning right here. Here's our shortwave. Here's the cutoff. Here's the broad ridging bringing in warmth. I can't wait to show you these temperatures in a few moments here, but also to show you the drier conditions. Well, by the time we get here through the day on Thursday into Friday morning, these troughs merge and we open up that cutoff low into a broader wave. And that sweeps through the midsection of the country early this weekend, such that by Saturday morning, our best upper level support is somewhere here in Illinois, Iowa, Wisconsin for the development of a low. And that low then de deepens through the Great Lakes states up into Ontario and Quebec as we work through the weekend. Behind it, another ridge. But watch this. By December 15th, I'm going to see another shortwave kicking through here that could bring another low pressure system into the midsection of the United States. But if you don't mind, I'm just going to play it from here forward because I want you to see this. The models, as we work our way out toward the third week of this month, want to develop a pretty deep anchor of cold air right here over this part of Alaska. And we need to see what this setup is going to do to our precipitation and temperature patterns through, well, this will be the 22nd of December. So first, let's talk about precipitation. We've already seen this from our high-resolution NAM model. So there's the snow this morning, and we know that that system exits pretty quickly. So I'm going to pause it here, which gets us out to Wednesday morning. Now, from Wednesday through Thursday here, now getting into early, there it is. Let's call this uh, early Friday morning right there. Okay, what did we see? The cutoff low moved through Arizona, New Mexico, came through Texas, and now you can see where the low is developing in this area. It met up with a short wave, which right now is still bringing snow showers through Friday morning into parts of the, uh, the Rockies in through here. But this all comes together in the development of a low right here by Friday night, such that by Saturday morning, we've now produced the low in the center of it, could possibly be over Chicago. That's where the current operational European puts it. Cold front draped to the south, stormy conditions here, and wet. That wet moves through parts of the eastern Corn Belt. The European puts the snow swath from this part of Nebraska through Iowa, Minnesota, Wisconsin, into Ontario. And then the low deepens as it moves. So this means that on Sunday morning, we could get some snow showers wrapping on the backside of this with much colder air, and the storms and the heavier rain move off of the mid-Atlantic down to the southeast by the time we get to Sunday afternoon. Now that system curls up here and goes into uh, Quebec as our next system starts to take shape. So remember the second shortwave I said that comes through the northwest and then dips into the central plains by the 15th? Well, here's what the operational model is suggesting. And it's going to be there, but they're not really resolving it very well yet at this point. So we're going to watch it this week. So thinking about that, 
how much precip are we expecting for this system? Well, as it comes into the Northwest, you can see here return of normal moisture now to parts of coastal Oregon and Washington, building up some snow in the Northern Rockies here as well. From there, when the system takes shape Friday into Saturday, we're going to watch this quarter and through here for maybe three quarters of an inch to an inch and a half at rainfall with where there could be storms farther to the south, locally heavier amounts. The European has this all pegged over as snow. And let's take a look at how much we're expecting here. Operational European model is picking up here for the potential, notice here from this part of Nebraska through Iowa, Minnesota, Wisconsin, two to four or five inches, and then heavier amounts once you get over into this area. Now, this is just an operational run of the model. Keep that in mind. Before I show you what some of the other models are saying, Big snows in the Cascades, love to see that, and also in this part of the Rockies where we could be picking up more than a foot of snow. From there though, let me show you the GFS. Now notice the GFS has got the low, not over Chicago, but instead over like Marquette. So it's really far to the north here. So that would take the snow swath and back it farther to the north and bring much more rain into this corridor with this system. The European has considerable spread in its ensemble but it doesn't have as far north of a trajectory on the low as the GFS does. Now, if the actual low pos uh, pressure position is farther to the south of the Ohio River Valley, just take all that snow we saw here and shift it farther to the south, okay? But to finish this up, the GFS really brings the heaviest snow corridor through here, where if you remember, the European was in through there. So a different setup here, and that's because we're still waiting to see this low emerge over the Aleutian Islands in the next two days. So there's a plenty of potential for this to kind of wiggle around. Now from there, getting out to day 10, remember we were starting to see the models really anchor that cold air back over Alaska. And when I see this pattern setting up, what I see is very strong jet stream flow like this. Now it's not coming from this direction, so let's get that off of there. It's gonna be targeting the Pacific Northwest. So unfortunately, California, we continue to stay very dry, but the Pacific Northwest is going to be much above average in terms of precipitation. We do have the system coming through here on the 15th, but then this is looking at that time period, basically going from then on out to the end of week two. And what we do notice is that overall, with the pattern resetting over Alaska, maybe just to return back to normal precipitation, even a slightly dry bias here, exclusively looking into week two. From there, let's talk temperatures. Over the last week, the buildup of that large ridge, that positive PNA pattern, took temperatures here over 20 degrees above average in this area, while the cold air was really set up here down across the southern part of the United States. Well, where are we taking this? Well, we can explain it in a couple of different ways. The models did an excellent job at picking up on this, you know, this two-wave pattern here in the uh, polar vortex. See it? But as the models projected and they're continuing to do this, things come back together right here by the middle of this week. What has a lot of us intrigued is that the model runs over the weekend started to split by mid-month the polar vortex potentially up into two other pieces, one here over this part of Russia and Kazakhstan, and then a second one here over the Hudson Bay. And there's quite a bit of warming that's happening in this section of like the Bering Sea and the Chukchi Sea. Now with that, this elongation, we do see that the uh, zonal winds at that level are actually starting to drop off. They're now forecast to do this over the next 10 days, and that would take them below average. We are going to watch this to see if there's any more of a significant disruption moving forward that could really upset the temperature pattern, not in the next two weeks, but maybe by the end of December and through January. Remember, it takes time because this change that you just saw me animate here has yet to give a, us a true reflection into the troposphere. It's all still up there in the stratosphere. That's what we have to watch for is a connection between the stratosphere and the troposphere. So from there, watch these temperatures. Are you ready? Much above average in this section of the plains today, while the cool air is still exiting here off the southeast. These are high temperatures, and the numbers represent the forecast high. The colors are the departure from normal. On Tuesday, look at this. I mean, we're seeing temperatures approaching 30 degrees above average, temperatures in the 60s here, and it's dry. There's Tuesday into Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. This is now where the troughs start to meet up and the system comes through the midsection of the country. There it is. By Saturday and Sunday, things return to normal. But my goodness, what a mild week that's ahead of us here. After that, what about days 5 through 10? Remember, this is where we started to see the coldest air gathering back into this area. 
The GFS shows it. The European shows it. The European has more broad scale, milder conditions in day 5 through 10 than the GFS does, but it's not as though the GFS is cold. And as we go out to day 10 through 15, the models really do agree on that pattern establishing here, keeping us through middle of the month across much of the lower 48 with uh, you know, a warmer bias in our temperatures here. Doesn't mean we won't get shots of cooler air, just a mild bias for this time of year uh, here in December. Beyond that, a couple of things to take note of. The La Nina really pushing its trade winds strongly here over. In fact, the edge of them is pushing right into this area. And that is where the MJ was currently sitting and is forecast to stay possibly not only through the next two weeks, but beyond that. That produces large scale rising motion in this part of the world and subsidence over here. Okay. Now, given that that's what the La Nina MJO are doing, we got to talk about South America. Surface soil moisture anomalies from the SMAP sensor here continues to show dry conditions in through this corridor. I matched that up with what was going on with the GRACE data, and you can see a very similar pattern. So thinking about soil moisture, I want to now put the context of our precipitation forecasts into the context of soil moisture, which is over here on the right. The European model over the next week is favoring a corridor in through here of wetter conditions, returning moisture to Mato Grosso, uh, getting over here to like Bahia in that region of Minas Gerais, okay? Drier in southern Brazil, drier in Argentina. So what we're expecting is an improvement up to 10% in the soil moisture values here. Whoops, that's a broad circle right in through there. With drier conditions in Mato Grosso do Sul down into Paraná over this upcoming week. Okay, from there, let's now look at days 7 through 14. The models are once again showing a drier corridor here, which clips Mato Grosso, where we could lose upwards of 5 to 7% of our soil moisture in that area. It's wetter farther to the south here, Paraguay, uh, going over toward Rio Grande do Sol and, and Paraná, and even this section of Argentina, which is critical to get this moisture this time of year. But what I want to show you to finish this up is the newest long range update from the European model for December, January, February. When I saw this show up over the weekend, I was quite surprised at how dry things were kept in through here, which gets over toward Mato Grosso. Wet in Brazil's southern growing areas, but very typical of La Nina, drier down here in Argentina. That again is going to be something I'm going to give you a much more detailed analysis about in my Wednesday long range update. But I want you to see the data here this morning on Monday. Hey, have a great rest of your week. I'll talk to you again very soon. Thank you.